Well, good afternoon. My watch says that it's officially Berkeley time to start, 10 minutes after the hour. Uh, my name is Costas Panos. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences and director of Citrus and the Banato Institute. And it's my honor to, uh, to introduce uh, the speaker in this presentation. But before I go to that, I would like to let you know that uh, those of you who participate here are part of a long tradition. We have been doing this in Citrus, the research exchange, for about 10 years now. And we look forward to seeing you in this, uh, the fall series of 2019 in this research exchange. So today's talk uh, is co-presented with our, our Citrus Women in Tech Initiative, which promotes the equitable participation of women as benchmark against the participation of men in the tech industry with regard to career longevity, career progression, career pathways, and career recognition. All of these are very, very measurable things. So it's a very data-driven approach to a very important issue. So our speaker today is Oscar Dibon, Vice Chancellor of Equity and Inclusion at UC Berkeley. In today's talk, Vice Chancellor Dibon will be discussing equity and inclusion in the interest of society. So during the talk, uh, we run a very interactive forum, but I will ask you to, to refrain from, uh, from interruption until uh, the talk is concluded, and we'll have a generous portion for Q&A. So before I introduce our speaker, a few announcements. Uh, next week is a very exciting week here for us, 28th to 31st of October. It's a costume building open house that Citrus, uh, that Citrus is sponsoring. And uh, the Citrus Invention Lab is uh, so you can 3D your costume if you want. Uh, 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 get ready for Halloween. So uh, the event is open to all, uh, but waivers will be needed to be signed by the non-maker pass holders. So it's a fairly open, open forum. Uh, 11 to noon. Banat Auditorium, Sotarja Dai Hall. So the next Citrus Research Exchange, next week, same time, same place, is a multimodal deep learning system for monitoring nuclear proliferation activities using open sources. And it is uh, going to feature, it's going to be presented by Jana Feldman. Again, same, same time, same place next week. It should be quite exciting. Uh, on the 30th, uh, the Fang Institute has, uh, has the continuation of the engineering leadership speaking series, 4 to 5 p.m. in the same, in Banat Auditorium here. And a very important uh, deadline is approaching. The end of the month, October 31st, is the deadline for the Athena Award nominations. So the Women in Tech Institute at the University of California uh, have instituted the Athena Awards to recognize those who embody, encourage, and promote the inclusion of women in technology. Uh, so we have uh, several years running, or three or four years, uh, two or three years running of that. So all these have been leaders who inspire others to pursue and persist in technical careers by way of their outstanding contributions, service, mentorship to foster inclusion in science and technical fields. I would like to note that nominations are open to all candidates, regardless of gender, age, institution affiliation, or country of residence. Again, nominations are due at the end of, at the, end of the day on October 31st, 2019. And you can find information at the city's website. So, now let me introduce our speaker, Professor Oscar Dibon Jr., who is appointed Vice Chancellor of Equity and Inclusion at UC Berkeley on July 1st, 2017. He leads campus-wide efforts through the Division of Equity and Inclusion to broaden the participation of all members of the campus community, particularly those who have been historically underrepresented and are unwelcomed in the pursuit of the university's mission of access and excellence. Uh, working with division professionals, campus partners, and the broader university community, Dibon pursues programs and services that lead to academic access and success for students, enable pathways to leadership and advancement for staff, build equitable structures for all members of the campus community, and close community gaps for our most marginalized group. So, Professor Dibon envisions a campus where all Berkeley students, faculty, staff feel welcome, valued, and supported, and nobody could argue with that mission. But I would like to say that uh, before his appointment, uh, Dibon served as the Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion in the College of Engineering in a very similar role, more closer to home. So in those roles, he guided uh, Engineering Student Services, ESS, building programs to recruit and retain students for historically, from historically underrepresented groups, supporting efforts to achieve a more diverse faculty and ensuring that the college fosters and maintains a welcoming and inclusive environment for the college community. So I'm glad to see Professor Dibon taking uh, an engineering approach to a very important program and scaling it up to the campus level. And for his efforts, he has already been recognized by the 2016 Chancellor's Award for Advancing Institutional Excellence and Equity. So Oscar, all yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, well, uh, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. So as uh, Kosa has mentioned, my name is Oscar Dubon. My preferred pronouns are he, him. And I'm really thrilled to be here when what I would say feels like home always when I come back to the engineering space, given that I've been here almost 30 years in the College of Engineering as a grad student, as a postdoc, as a faculty member, and also as an administrator. So this is a near and dear place to me. And I'm gonna, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I, was, how I planned this a uh, little journey uh, this, this afternoon. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what ENI does uh, because uh, what I have found over the, over the two plus years I've been in the vice chancellor role, um, you know, we don't always know what each other is doing on campus and certainly even the work of ENI as a division is uh, uh, not always, um, uh, there's not an awareness of it and I think this is a great opportunity for um, the north side of campus to really uh, understand that a little better. Then I'm going to talk about sort of some of the challenges that I have seen and how uh, we think about issues of othering and belonging, how that is a general issue around climate, but also how that can inform the work that we do as engineers, as technologists, as innovators, and then I'll give a few concluding remarks. So that kind of looks, that's basically where we're going to go. So uh, first, um, aside from the professional stuff, Little thing about me, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, so my very first professional identity is engineer, but right now I do a lot of social justice work, and that's something that I would say is part of my DNA, and I think a lot of us, uh, I'm sure you all, have that type of multiple types of uh, commitments that might seem very separate, but in fact, you as, an, as a person bring those together based on your experiences, and your lived experiences, and uh, how you find ways to uh, put those, combine those in your life. So I'm going to give sort of one of my first experiences, technical experiences. I used to, uh, when I was six years old, I lived in Chile, and uh, my father was working in the mountains uh, as an engineer and uh, overseeing the construction of a telescope. And one of the first things I experienced was actually seeing the rings of Saturn like exactly like this uh, through a telescope. And that was really something that I, I still keep that I, that, that memory of, of seeing Saturn um, so vividly um, through that telescope, and, and I think that's part of who um, I, I am in terms of my technical self. Just for proof that I was there, um, this is the 100-inch telescope structure that uh, my father was working on, and there's a rail there, and that's under construction over here. That's my dad and my two sisters, and that's me over here. Um, my, it turns out that my older sister, she's a principal engineer at the Jet Propulsion Lab, so there's a connection here between um, my father's an engineer, I became an engineer, my sister became an engineer, and my younger sister became a rebel. So, <laughs> and she still is, she keeps us uh, on our toes always. Another part of it, though, is also that my parents are from Nicaragua, and it turns out that even though I was born here, I actually lived in Nicaragua in the, during the 70s because my father wanted to move back. And so he moved back, we moved back as a family, and I was there during the time of the revolution in Nicaragua. And so I, you know, I would go to school, um, there would be, um, you know, there would be violence um, at some level, there would be um, school closures, all those types of things that are related with the type of violent turmoil that you see in places that have political unrest. And so, um, so that's something that also informed how I see the world. And so now maybe you start seeing, I'm very interested in social justice, I'm an engineer, right? So how do those things come together? I've been very lucky that here, at, I've been here at Cal for, as I mentioned, for almost 30 years. And um, I've been very fortunate that I've had been able to do that. As an administrator, I bring in that, that commitment I have. I wanna, be the I wanna be the change that I wanna see in that social justice space but I'm still an engineer, I still have a research group. I love semiconductor research, that's, everyone knows that. Um, and, and that's something that really is part of my identity. I wanted to share some of the types of activities that the Division of Equity and Inclusion does so that, you'll, so that you have a sense of what does this division do? Um, we serve a lot of students. Um, and as you can see here, that in, uh, these are uh, programs that cover uh, different types of experiences of students and certain identities. Um, and we serve about 13,000 students, whether they're student parents, transfer students, 
um, first generation college goers, uh, formerly incarcerated, former foster youth. We have programs that are supporting those students to be successful here at Cal. And there are students with those types of experience who are also trying to become engineers. So what does it mean to become an engineer and have that type of life, life li uh, lived experience that is informing your work too and their work too? Uh, we also, ha uh, we also uh, inaugurated the opening of the Basic Needs Center last year. Um, if you, if, um, that's really a, a wonderful resource, um, sadly needed resource. Um, I wish we didn't need to have a Basic Needs Center, uh, but we have one, and that's really to uh, help the community uh, face a very uh, stressful situations and really, um, and sometimes um, life-changing situations around food insecurity, around housing insecurity. We try to develop programs around rapid rehousing, finding ways to support our students um, principally in, in, uh, in the needs that they have so that they can focus on why they're here, which is that academic experience, those co-curricular activities, and really um, us really support them in the way they need to be supported to be successful. Um, we also have the uh, Disabled Students Program, and uh, that's something that um, actually the University of California, some of you may know, uh, we were pioneers in, in, in uh, supporting disabled students. And that was a student-led, uh, I'll say, uh, revolution here in uh, really transforming how uh, the whole, all, all, all of society in the United States and beyond, uh, how we engage disabled students, how we engage the disabled community, and really making the change so that they could have equal access to their civil rights um, around learning and around other types of accessibility issues. As you can see, the numbers are staggering. So in 2009, 2010, we had about less than, fewer than 1,000 registered DSP students. This year, uh, last year, we had 3,100. When you look at the, the type, number of accom specific accommodations, they're in the tens of thousands, right? This is a really important part of what the university needs to continue to, tr to pursue in doing the best possible. This is about students civil rights. This is not a luxury. This is not optional. When we're performing accommodations, we're actually meeting our commitment and our obligation to a person's civil rights. So this is something that we take seriously. We work in collaboration with um, our, our um, staff and faculty, uh, but it's still uh, very challenging. And anyone who's, who has engaged in this space understand that this is a very challenging but super important area. We support our, our, our students who are enrolled at Cal, but we also have an extensive uh, pre-college and community college um, program, set of programs. We touch over 70,000 high school students through 200 partnership partnering schools and colleges. Um, a lot of the programs that you might uh, uh, have heard of, Upward Bound, Puente, EOP, a lot of the Department of Education TRIO programs, um, all of these are uh, here at Cal. And we actually serve the state of California because the University of California Office of the President um, sometimes place, uh, through agreements, places certain uh, statewide programs in different campuses. So um, that's what we do for a lot of the college programs. Uh, we have a very uh, powerful model, the Destination College Advising Corps, which actually um, uh, engages uh, recent college grads to become counselors at high schools, especially at high schools where um, uh, there's a connection of the counselor's identity and the predominant population um, of, that of, of that high school. So really finding ways to uh, diversify not just uh, Berkeley, but also diversify higher education. And so you can see the connection here. We're trying to grow the flow of students, but we also need to be ready and prepared to serve the students once they come here. And that's this combination of the two types of services that we provide. Um, we have also uh, other types of um, uh, uh, engagements uh, on, in, um, in the division around uh, identity. So we have African American student development, Native American student development, uh, Chicanx, Latinx student development. Uh, the Gender Equity Center is also here uh, in our division. So we find ways to support um, our, our students in all of those complex intersecting ways, understanding that um, 
just to navigate through the academics is a challenge, let alone if there are other types of barriers that, f that happen because there are barriers in any institution, certainly here at Cal, um, where there's, I would say, some level of uh, dehumanization that we experience right now societally, and certainly we are, as an institution, a microcosm of that, and we need to acknowledge that. And the work is to bring change there. We have some um, initiatives that we are um, pursuing. Some of you would have, may have received or should, uh, should have received a, an email from me last year around a cl campus climate survey called My Experience. That was me, my fault, <laughs> but very good reason. And if you fill it out, you don't get a follow-up email. So we were very careful about that. So um, uh, we, the results will show up, we're, we'll be presented to the campus uh, this year. We're right now working on um, really uh, informing uh, the different units around um, what the campus climate results were. There's an African-American initiative that we also uh, was started actually already several years back to make sure that we understand how to um, and support um, the success of African-American uh, students, but also the success of faculty, African-American faculty and staff, and understand things like anti-blackness, racial profiling, th um, these issues that are really affecting um, the, how a community thrives here on campus, uh, particularly the black community. Um, we're, uh, the chancellor has stated uh, becoming a Hispanic serving institution. It doesn't mean we're gonna become UNAM in Mexico. It means that we're going to serve the state of California the, it, in the way that um, the demographics of California show. So we, are a pub, we have a public mission, we're a land grant institution, and so we're not uh, moving demographics in any way, in any uh, other way that the state is telling us that we need to do in order to prepare the state to continue to be competitive. And that means serving all populations, including the Latinx population. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now. So that's kind of e and I. I haven't even talked about uh, our faculty initiatives. Um, we have our, our staff initiative. We, have a, we, ha we actually have a, a faculty leadership academy. Um, we also work with uh, human resources on the leadership and career enhancement programs for a staff of color. Um, we have different types of initiatives that also engage uh, uh, staff and faculty because uh, we, are he I, we are here primarily for our students. We are here to serve our students but we need to make sure that we are supporting each other as faculty and staff so that we can meet that mission the best way possible. So uh, that's part of what uh, Cal does and what the division does. So a few things that you already, I'm sure, know. Um, we have some distinctions. We're the number one public university in the world. I think, uh, arguably, uh, I feel that in my heart. I see this all the time in all the work that you all do um, as faculty, as staff, as students. It's really an amazing place. We have been recognized in different ways, of course, through Nobel Prizes. The first national Department of Energy National Lab was established here, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. We've done amazing things, like I mentioned. We've pioneered um, the, dis the, dis the disabled students' movement started here and is the reason for, um, part in, strong, in, in a big way, for ADA. Um, we were leaders in, in the anti-apartheid movement. Um, when uh, Nelson Mandela came to the US, the first place that he visited was UC Berkeley, given the importance that UC Berkeley played in making sure that change happened. That's very powerful. But there are also some other powerful pieces. One, David Blackwell, the new uh, hall, the new dorm. Um, first African-American uh, uh, who became member of the National Academy of Sciences. First uh, black uh, chair, department chair um, at UC Berkeley already, I believe, in the 1950s. So it took that long, around 90 years, for that to happen. But then we have things like Lacan. That's the complexity of the relationship that we have as a society with our institutions. Lacan, founder of Sierra Club, first pres jo uh, Joseph Lacan, first president of the uh, University of California, Berkeley, also a white supremacist, involved in the, in the, in the Civil War, uh, supporting the Confederacy. Brother, third president of UC Berkeley, also here. The then, at the time, Lacan Hall, which is a physics building, was the largest physics building in the country, is named after John and Joseph Lacan. So what does that mean ab about us? How do we acknowledge the past, 
while not necessarily celebrating um, what the, va the values of, of individuals, right? So as you may know, um, there's an elementary school in Berkeley that changed its name from Lacan to the Sylvia Mendez um, School. Um, there, and, that, and Sylvia Mendez was part of the first lawsuit that helped desegregate um, uh, schools in California because there were Mexican schools and there were schools for, for whites. And that law school, it was a really uh, the predecessor to Brown versus Board of Education. But that, was, uh, that happened here in California. So that's how that was changed. The Sierra Club is trying to change some names around Lacan. So what are we doing so that we are more welcoming to all our communities and when we walk across a building, we're not reminded that this, this, we haven't moved on from the white supremacy um, mindset upon which parts of this university, structures of this university were built, right? Those are the types of dialogues that we need to have. So what does the community say? I'm gonna talk about the, cam the campus leadership. I think it's very clear and I admire a great deal and I respect and um, am I really uh, feel very lucky that I'm working, uh, have a, a pretty amazing boss, Carol Chris, the first female chancellor in 150 years here at UC Berkeley. Took 150 years to have our first female chancellor. Just, you know, okay. So <laughs> just, just putting that out there. Okay, so what does that mean? There's a real strong commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity, right? We want this place to be fair. We want to, this place to reflect the state of California, right? Um, and we want people to be at the table. But we want some more, and that's something I'm going to mention around other and belonging. So what does the campus community say? So these are types of statements that I have heard over repeatedly um, here at UC Berkeley as I've gone and talked to communities over the past uh, couple of years, few years actually. Campus leadership and faculty do not reflect us. We do not see ourselves in the faculty. And I'm talking a lot about communities that have been uh, historically and currently marginalized. Campus staff management is not diverse. We do not see opportunities for advancement. The demands that we are presenting to you were presented to campus leadership one or two decades ago. I have seen documents that are 20 years old and the requests are exactly the same that are being made now. So what does that say about our institution and maintaining the status quo versus moving forward in the way that we need to? Um, we want our leadership and teachers to partake in cultural sensitivity training. I don't know if, uh, if that's something that uh, is discussed here. Um, I know that's something that is constantly discussed, um, especially in uh, communities of color, in uh, marginalized communities, in the disabled community. Um, it's something that's really on one's mind because we, uh, the, the communities, want to be um, engage in a way that their full authentic self is appreciated and respected. That's really what it's about. So that's what the we is of the community. But what the university reflects is that you don't belong because the structures are there because what I, just from what I mentioned to you about that history that exists, took 150 years for the first um, female chancellor took 90 years for that first black department chair. First president, white supremacist, right? All of those things add up and they lead to certain circumstances in which not only are members of our community feeling a certain way, but their sense, they're, they're perceiving from the, from the campus, from the university, from the structures, not even from the people. The structures themselves are perpetuating this message that you don't belong. Not that I don't feel like I belong, it's more proactive, it's you don't belong. And that's the work that Avi and I, and the work that we all need to do. So to me, that goes to this idea that um, we have the distinct uh, privilege of really uh, having a, a scholar here at Berkeley named John Powell. And he, he oftentimes, the Othering and Belonging Conference happens in this very auditorium. And talking about what does, what does Othering and Belonging mean? And the way that John and Stephen mentioned is that the problem of the 21st century is a problem of othering. It's this, it's this persistent 
dehumanization, not acknowledging the multi-layered nature of our identities and respecting those. And so when I come to the room, I don't check part of myself at the door. I'm allowed, I am invited to come to that room with all my complexities, warts and all, all of those things, but to engage as my full authentic self. That is a challenge, that, that denial of the full humanity of the person. And that's happening on the national scale right now. There's constant dehumanization happening now. You might call it racism, you might call it xenophobia, you might call it anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, all these phobias and isms. It's a, it's a systematic and systemic dehumanization that is happening in society. And we need to find a way to come together and grapple with that. Okay, so right now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a few minutes and show you a video of the actual voices of the community. My name is Sophia Beltran. My name is Rubea. My pronouns are they, them. I'm Josh. My name is Gia or Juniper Angelica. I use she, her pronouns. I'm Martin. I'm a master of public health student in health and social behavior. I'm studying material science and engineering. I'm in the PhD program. I am a student, a fifth year transfer and ethnic studies major. I'm a researcher. I'm an HIV test counselor. I'm, I'm a mother. I'm a person, human being. While UC Berkeley is considered to be one of the most LGBTQ plus inclusive universities in the United States, there's still work to be done by all of us to ensure our LGBTQ plus graduate and undergraduate students have a seamless and inclusive learning, teaching and research experience. When I first was impacted by my own identity, started when I was maybe even five years old, I think that's when school started to shape who I felt that I thought I was. Whether it was going to the bathroom, being shoved into the uh, boys' bathroom when I was really young, um, to growing up in high school and feeling excluded or made fun of because teachers in the roll call would realize that my name was Sophia and I would raise my hand and people would be like, your name's Sophia, like you have to prove it, like you, I don't believe you. Professors hold a lot of power that they may, may not realize that they have a lot of influence that they do. They are kind of the, the sort of foundations of the department. They, they do hold up the department and um, I've seen both positive and negative influences that the professors can have on making students or other professors feel welcomed. Creating an inclusive classroom experience can be as simple as learning student pronouns and LGBT related terminology, including LGBTQ plus readings or examples within your curriculum addressing homophobic or transphobic hate speech in the classroom, or coming out as an LGBTQ faculty member. So it's quite intimidating for people coming into these fields, especially at an undergrad level where you're trying to decide what, what fields you want to go into. And if you feel intimidated or um, that it's not for you, or discouraged to go into that field, that could be both harmful for progressing science, but also for those students' needs. STEM is very men-dominated, so I think for me, specifically being a trans firm, it does definitely feel, I do definitely feel awkward like in a lot of spaces. I feel like many people in STEM are disconnected from what's going on, or they're able to be disconnected. And so when I bring up these issues, I kind of don't want to seem like I'm being too mad or that I'm taking too much space. There's like things that you've got to teach, right? But that doesn't mean that professors don't have a lot of interactions with students, um, sort of personal relationships with students in terms of like mentoring, um, office hours, uh, advising students, and I think in sort of that respect of being a professor, you're not a professor just to teach material, you also build relationships with your students. Making sure to ask people their pronouns in the beginning of the class, like when you're doing introductions, that was really important for me for my first year. One, only one of my classes did that, but all my other classes when we had deeper discussions and people would start to misgender me, then it becomes really awkward to try to correct them in front of like 30 people. I think letting us know, uh, maybe trans folks, so that we can send emails about our pronouns to them. 
so that they can put it on their roster or if we want to change our name in the roster or something. As it pertains to grad school, a lot of times professors will have events at their houses or lab activities and a lot of times significant others are invited and it could be important to make sure that it's open to all types of significant others so make sure it's inclusive in, uh, in terms of the language that they use. If you've ever taken the statistics class, they do a lot of gender binary stuff, uh, which can be very hurtful to people who are non-binary. I've experienced that too. The College of Chemistry does an event uh, once a year uh, that's the LGBT science reception. Um, and so that's very nice uh, because we get to see someone from the queer community talk about science, their experiences in the field, and it brings out those voices and it makes us want to continue to be in this field. I think it was one or two years ago was the fight for queer spaces movement. Professors were involved in that, for example. If they showed their solidarity and were like, you know, yeah, we have LGBTQ students who sometimes find it hard to participate in our classes or stuff because they're trying to find space on campus to exist. and They also have to worry about a lot of other uh, basic needs and stuff. That's one way, that's one direct way that professors can be involved is to show their solidarity like that. We look up to our professors, um, assuming they know what they're talking about, assuming they have like the history and the education to teach us. Um, and aside from like the subject of teaching us, they're also teaching us like how do you treat others, how do you tr how do you act in power in positions of power? And our professors are in positions of power. So I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things. You know, I think as an engineer, I think about, well, what are the types of uh, solutions that we can think about? Um, and I think it goes back to something about what was uh, reported at the Academy, in the uh, National Academy of Engineering report about understanding how we look at problems. So we were trying, we're, I, I work a lot on community building, but when you think about community building and the type of work that we do here, including all the innovation work. So who owns the project? Whose knowledge counts? Who benefits? How are we asking these questions that really start to think about how are we bringing, how are we being informed by the very communities that we're trying to serve, right? And that involves inviting people to feel belonging in the process. And that's what I want to think next, uh, present next. Um, so John Powell, this is John Powell, okay? And when you look at John, when you, when you, uh, John Paul, what he presents is the othering piece and the belonging piece. So othering, denying people's humanity. Belonging, it's welcoming people's full humanity and engaging and inviting a process of co-creation. And if there's one thing I wanna leave you with today is the idea of co-creation. How do you, how, belonging seems like a very soft, type of concept of how do, you, how, do you, how do you promote belonging? You have to invite people to come with their full authentic selves to co-create something. So you're not just inviting them to the table, you're co-creating the table. And that's the type of mindset that one really needs to move forward in, in, a, in when we start looking at the types of uh, problems that we address as technical individuals. So I'm gonna skip that one. So I'm gonna talk about one piece around any challenge that we have now is going to involve teams. And so one is how do you promote belonging in teams and how, do you, how are teams the most effective possible? And there's a lot of work that has been done on the idea of collective intelligence, where as you, know, as you may know, it's not about gathering the smartest, the quote unquote smartest people in the, in the, into the team, although that's sometimes how we operate even here right, the, the smartest people are invited to the group. Um, it's about understanding, uh, right here, it, the success is correlated with the average social sensitivity of a group members, of the group members, the equality in distribution of conversational uh, turn taking, very simple things, and the proportion of females in the group. That piece of proportion of females in the group goes to the issue of 
uh, inviting people to bring their full authentic self and to have diverse views to inform the work. And that's what was analyzed in this paper about what does it, why is it that females made the, uh, the groups better? And it had to do with inviting that conversation. And so here are some tips. When you're engaging as a team, establish norms for even distribution of speaking terms. Reduce status differences. Leverage no knowledge uh, within the diversity that you have in your team. Cultivate team trust and establish a culture of co-creation and accountability. Okay? So when I think about the types of challenges that we're facing, this is, these are not, this is not my list. This is the list of National Academy of Engineering. You now there are all sorts of things that talk about making solar energy economical, provide energy for, from fusion, all these things. Doesn't talk as much about people, right? And when we're, when we're now moving into a different type of society that we're used to 100, um, in the 20th century, right? One that was built on certain types of structures that I already mentioned, including white supremacy, right? That's not what the future looks like for a state of California. So we need to find ways to engage. And this is not the, about the individual. This is not about a person being a white supremacist. This is about the structures that have been developed over decades that have led to that. And so even we all operate under these structures, and whether or not we want to move in one way or another, sometimes we just move in that direction because that's what the structures were built to do. And, and unpacking that is really what matters. So the way I see it is we also need to move into a space where we're harnessing the diversity that we have in our society so that we can do the co-creation that we need to, to really address the, chal the, the challenges that this century society has, not the society from the last century or the century before. The excellence is informed by the society in which that excellence exists. So I'm just gonna finish with a couple, uh, three bullets. Today's and tomorrow's challenges require teams of solvers. Excellent, relevant teams must reflect society. In the 21st century, this means that the teams must be diverse. That's just, if you want a relevant solution, you have to bring people to the table, not just to sit at the table, but to co-create the table. The most successful teams invite all members to bring the full humanity, their full humanity into a co-creation process. So that's really what we need to move forward in, and when you think about all the innovation that happens at Cal, how we have conversations here in this space, and Citrus, how are we co-creating? Th that's the very first thing, are we, co are, we bringing, are we inviting people to the table, their full authentic selves, and are we going through a process of co-creation, not just saying, you're lucky to be at the table, uh, give us, tell us what you think, and that's it. Right? That's not a co-creation process. And that, that's the type of paradigm shift that we need to move into, going from away from inclusion of just including people, but actually inviting belonging, people to feel that belonging and to bring their full talents. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so we're gonna open it up for a question and uh, Q&A for about 10 minutes. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will get a mic to you between Kay and I. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I was curious about how this plays out in the classroom because I see, I teach teaming and across the engineering school and I see one of two challenges. One, the students are so busy because of their degree requirements that they feel like they have to prioritize the technical over the social skills or the human being skills. And two, we're trying to teach them how to collaborate but then they're competing against each other for grades. Mm -hmm. And I just find that to be a really insurmountable barrier mm -hmm. with the faculty that I work with. So I was just mm -hmm. curious kind of what conversations you're having to rethink mm -hmm. curriculum mm -hmm. as a means of creating more inclusive learning environments. Yeah. So, so, so that, I think that's a really great question. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is um, the, number, the number one 
constituent group that 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 uh, really um, can set course to uh, culture and climate, it's a faculty. Sometimes, I'll, I'm a faculty member, sometimes we don't understand or acknowledge that because we say, oh, we're, we're not really involved, it's, it's the student's issues, let's go see what the student need is. But we set the tone. So if we're requiring a curve, for example, which I think is the least constructive uh, strategy for uh, to, in promoting collaboration, then we're already sending a message that we're not valuing collaboration. So there are certain things around pedagogy and around curriculum that we can do. The curricular piece is also, um, how do we talk about, you know, it was mentioned in this video about statistics, right? How do we, how do we, how do we create examples that visibilize multiple communities? It doesn't mean that every single example needs to be an answer to everyone, but we need to be more uh, conscious about how are we helping others see themselves and how we help our colleagues see us in that. Whoever, and, I'm, and I'm not saying us in any way, I'm saying this group A and group B. So that's part of the curricular piece. Um, I think there is movement forward. I think uh, a lot of these uh, pedagogy courses st are starting to do that piece, but that really only addresses the graduate student instructor. It doesn't address the faculty. I think ultimately, Faculty, Academic Senate, we need to have that conversation and be committed to the change that we want to see, um, assuming that we agree of what we want to see. And I think if some of us is convincing our colleagues, it matters to remain excellent because the strategies for excellence uh, last century, they're not going to work this century. And that's, it's, it's not about inclusive excellence, it's not about any qualified excellence, it's about excellence. But excellence has a societal context, and that's the part that all of these pieces feed into, and we need to make that case. Thank you, Oscar. Um, I was glad to hear the um, response about the faculty and the students in the curriculum, but um, also, and I have a question about mm. uh, the role that potentially the ORUs can play in your scheme here, mm. um, because you know, as Citrus and many of us work more heavily sort of on the research mm. side of the uh, enterprise, and I wonder if you had thoughts about how we, as a research institute, can also be actively promoting some of these ideals. Um, I, I, you know, uh, I'll say, uh, like many organizations, we struggle with siloing. I think uh, there's not enough communication, um, say, between uh, faculty who are not in ORUs with the actual ORUs who sometimes take the life of their own. And maybe they're sometimes driven by only a couple of faculty members, right? So there's all sorts of dynamics um, that really uh, conspire to make it a challenge. On the other hand, ORUs provide this amazing ecosystem where you can explore things beyond what would be constrained within a normal academic framework, say around curriculum, say around uh, uh, being proactive on how to engage, you know, um, breaking down, uh, it, I, I always say finding the joy of rigor without uh, falling into this competitive uh, cycle, competitiveness cycle. I think those are two different things, but we don't separate those. So, you know, I think these ORUs can actually be a very nice ecosystem where you're exploring things that are academic, but they don't have to uh, go through that academic process that departments are um, really, sometimes we're constrained by because there's so much decades of traditions around how departments work. And I also think um, staff engagement could be more powerful in ORUs. I think finding ways to have those partnerships uh, be, uh, between staff and faculty and then engaging students, I think that is something that's more natural in an ORU than it is sometimes in departments. So. Um, those are, I mean, those are, that's a very, very valid point. Do you have any tips for authentically reaching out to engage students in activities, especially those that are perhaps not part of clubs, which are mm. a little harder to mm. reach? And then related to that, you know, Berkeley just being a very stressful mm. environment, adding the stress of identity mm. on top of that, what kind of mental health services mm. and supports do we need? Yeah. So, so uh, wellness, uh, writ large, specifically though, mental health is, is to me, that's a basic need right now. I mean, it's, it's really part of this basic need epidemic that we're having. Um, when you look at just how uh, 
campus communities in general are, fe are feeling, but specifically certainly students, it's a huge issue. Um, right now, uh, we work closely with, um, with uh, Student Affairs, which uh, University Health Services is within the Student Affairs Office. And we're trying to find ways of thinking about, um, you know, how can we uh, demystify um, that finding help, that seeking support isn't uh, seen as a deficiency or a flaw, but it's just uh, having support to do the work that you came here to do and, and the experience that you came here to have. So, um, so finding, doing things like I think a lot of these having uh, staff psychologists be in satellite offices, that's something that started in the College of Engineering and is now is happening more in other uh, programs. Um, having, uh, finding staff professionals um, who, that, have share, that are shared, some, uh, making a joint investment, so that's something that we're also doing with student affairs where we're trying to say support undocumented students in the, in the men mental health, but maybe undocumented students don't feel comfortable going to Tang. So finding ways to s meet students where they are, where they are, rather than asking students to, you have to fit into how we, can, how we, need, how we have chosen to provide services over the last decades. In terms of engaging students, I mean, I, I, I look around and I see my colleague here, for example, Marvin Lopez, and, uh, and I think, you know, uh, you know, this is the part where we don't know each other enough. They're actually, uh, there's communities of, 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 of individuals, of people who are uh, supporting students and finding ways to create those connections. And sometimes we are not creating or fostering those opportunities in, I would say, less um, typical ways, um, but finding, I would say, ways to engage um, and, and reaching out. And I think that's, that's part of getting to know our communities, but that is a huge issue. That's something I didn't appreciate as much until I started seeing campus-wide what the challenges are there about know, knowing what's happening here versus knowing what's happening here. We all know our space very locally, and I've been here 30 years, and I didn't know, uh, you know, uh, I knew maybe 5% of what I know now in the last, learned in the last two years. So that's a, that's a just work in progress, I would say. But um, always being out there, reaching out, I think is important, and just getting to know other colleagues, especially, I think, staff. The staff really are such an important engine of, of, uh, of uh, engagement. And, um, and we need to, as faculty, need to support staff in all the work that they're doing uh, to, to help be that glue that, and, and that motivation and that um, creativity that moves that engagement and makes it stronger. I'm so sorry. That's all the time we have for today. Um, Vice Chancellor, will you be sticking around for a few more minutes? Sure, I can. Yeah. yeah. So if you, if you have any comments, he'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Sorry about Thank the video. You, Vice Chancellor. But it was worth it, right? <laughs> <laughs>